Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, we have a few announcements to make. First, we'd like to thank our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. Last month, we launched the Dr. GPCR Symposia event series. Our first symposium was on March 24th, 2023, and it was on challenging GPCRs. It was a day filled with amazing talks, great discussions, and we hope the beginning of new collaborations. In case you missed it, you can watch the talks in the Dr. GPCR ecosystem with your premium membership. Also, mark your calendars for the next symposium coming up on May 19th, during which we will hear from speakers on GPCR activation and signaling. At all our symposia events, including the one coming in May, all trainees are welcome to present a poster. There won't be any poster selections, and everyone is welcome to join us for the poster slash networking time. For more information and an updated schedule can be found in the ecosystem. The easiest way to get to it is to use the links in the footer and look for Dr. GPCR Symposia. You can join us live by making marking your calendar and becoming a Dr. GPCR Ecosystem free site member. To navigate the ecosystem again, please use the direct links in the footer. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. Today, I'm excited to have with me Dr. Katerina Nemec. She is currently in the group of Madan Babu. And Katerina, I'm super excited to have you on today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's like a tremendous honor to be here. I was really, really happy and excited. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience, uh, because I think, as I was mentioning before we hit record this, I think this was the most rescheduled <laughs> podcast episode that I've ever uh, I've had to do. It's been so busy with all the conferences going on. But thank you for your flexibility. I'm super excited to talk to you. So why don't we start at the beginning? Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So I'm Katerina. Um, I was still mate in Yugoslavia, but born uh, when this country missing it integrated into many. So mm -hmm. I, I am actually bilingual. My mother is Slovenian. My father is Croatian. And I grew up uh, living and absorbing the culture of both countries. Um, so kind of uh, this mixture of many things uh, is kind of a really light motif in my life, I would say, because like I always loved to work in an interdisciplinary environment, loved like natural science, but medicine. So I ended up studying pharmacy in Slovenia and Germany. And I really enjoyed like its interdisciplinarity. Um, after my uh, master's, I moved to Berlin and I joined group of Martin Lose at Max Delbruck Center in of uh, Molecular Medicine. I did my PhD with him. And currently I am a lead researcher in the group of Madame Babu. I moved to US. I am at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Amazing. I see I, I knew that you were in Germany, but I didn't make the connection with with Martin Lose's uh, group. That's great. Uh, that's exciting. Let's take a step back and I like to get take my guests a little bit. You've listened to the podcast. Have you always known that you were interested in science or is it something that are you the only scientist in the family, in other words? Mm, uh, so I was surrounded by the people which had affection and respect for science. So my godmother was kind of a one superstar, which probably inspired me to do science a bit. She was active in the area of uh, public health and researching the influence of healthy diet on uh, disease outcomes. Mm -hmm. And she was that kind of a very inspiring woman, really so sharp, so innovative with answers and ideas. And she brought me always the absolutely best Christmas presents or like she took us to some like really nice trips. Uh, so that helped, I think. And uh, my father, which decided to do his master's degree in 50s, mm -hmm. because he was really into, he was into psychosociology. Mm -hmm. He was really interested in, he had that 
spark for the science. And since he did it at very late age and uh, was not so good with the computers, I ended up helping him writing some parts of the thesis or like doing some figures. But at very early age, it was my primary school or end of my primary school. So that was another like impact, I would say. And also my mother, she studied like maths and physics. So I think I inherited also some sympathy for natural sciences from her. Wow. So you were definitely surrounded, but at least three scientific figures, although they were in different disciplines, but that I already showed you how cool science is. Yeah, yeah. Like they had this affection and respect. And so I thought that helped. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. And what made you start a PhD? Um, so during my master's degree, I was uh, doing research on actually first GPCR, but I didn't really perceive it as a uh, GPCR. At that time, I was more interested into the pharmacogenetic properties of it. It was prostaglandin receptor EP4. Mm -hmm. Uh, that receptor has a role in uh, leukemia, chronic lymphatic leukemia. And like work about uh, that receptor was really kind of inspiring. I, I had a lot of moments, wow, well, like I am the first person doing some research about it. There is nothing described. So I always wanted to learn a bit more, analyze data, explore it. Um, and I appreciated kind of a the creativity which I was able to like when I was doing experiments you know design them in some uh, new like way that really or kind of a channel my stream of ideas and thoughts to make something work and like what was really important for me too is that I always thought that I'm doing something what would benefit society yeah. so and um, yeah, I studied pharmacy because I wanted to cure diseases. And I thought, okay, yeah, by doing like uh, like more research and PhD on that topic, I could contribute to that. That's amazing. And uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, you, you were interested in, in science and working in the lab. And did you realize that you were working on... Like, I always ask this question is like, when did you first start working on GPCRs? And I think it, by the sounds of it, it sounds to me that it was kind of by chance. But once you got to know EP4 and the receptor and the system, did you think, oh, not only this system is interesting, but the entire family of receptors uh, is interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of a, I think it was more fortunate uh, coincidence that uh, the group of Martin Lose picked mm -hmm. me up because I was a person who did something about GPCRs and there were not many. So I joined an interview round at Max mm -hmm. Brook Center and they contacted me. Ah, we saw you did something about GPCR. And that was kind of uh, the way how I came into the group. I interviewed with them, like I liked them, they liked me. And uh, that is how it happened. But when I kind of in the moment when I knew I would be speaking with Martin Lose and his group, I started to explore. And I was really impressed by the really kind of a diversity of roles which GPCRs have. Because before I was very, you know, focused and I was looking only on one receptor yeah. and what's more role in the disease. But uh, at that point, I was looking at the... Um, at a really whole group of GPCRs. So I like, like he's good. No, please. I was I, I didn't want to yeah, interrupt. Yeah. I think there's a little delay, so I didn't want to seem rude. Please uh, go ahead. I have a follow-up question <laughs> to that. Yeah, yeah. Like so I was really kind of uh, impressed by the really multi mode of the like functions like which GPCRs have all day guide uh, different signaling pathways, their role in disease. The amount of drugs which target GPCR is also impressive. Like we usually write in our abstracts around one third. Yeah. And, everyone, uh, that's there, everyone slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there is, uh, you know, the, still a big opportunity out there. They are like more drugs for GPCR in clinical trials. I believe there are some still 
unknown like drug targets like in orphan receptor okay. fields so so uh you were you were saying um that once you started interviewing and you met Martin Lose and his group you started really exploring and realizing how important GPCRs are from a pathophysiological perspective, how the signaling diversity is there, but also the fact that there are drugs that target GPCRs and we're still working on so many of these receptors. Exactly, yeah. So the, like I am now about to write a review about GPCRs and I needed to do literature research. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy. So much literature to go through and so many good publications or yeah. new concepts, new targets. Yeah, It's really crazy. Sounds like a full-time job. I mean, we, we collect on a weekly basis now the recently published papers because we figured it was just so much to do it on a monthly basis and send in the newsletter. You know, I think we had on average anywhere between 60 to 100 papers a month. Yeah. on GPCRs, but in the first two years, and I counted these manually at the time, we have collected and categorized a doctor GPCR from 2020 to 2021, uh, over a thousand papers across multiple disciplines, different topics. Well, so Hard to keep up with the field. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, which is why we kind of split up the newsletter to the weekly in order to make it, you know, a smaller, more digestible newsletter mm -hmm. for, for the community. But yeah. before we continue, I wanted to go back a little bit because you mentioned uh, when interviewing with Martin Lose's group is that you said something along the lines, I like them and they liked me. And mm -hmm. that is an important point to make when for for listeners especially people who are you know either looking for a phd or looking for their nest for a postdoc or even looking for their what we'll call quote unquote real job um it's important that you know they like you and you like them yeah because like otherwise and... yeah please Actually, the system, like in the many institutes which are having those big interview rounds, is such that you need to write your top three like candidates, like uh, and only if there is some match, you get a position. Mm -hmm. So they really, like uh, human resources department, really started to appreciate the notion that kind of a, the love needs to be mutual in order that the relationship works out yeah. or that PhD works out. Yeah. yeah. I always tell people, I think, you know, finding a job or finding a position is, is like dating. If you, if you don't like each other, <laughs> do not go there <laughs> because it's, it's, it's bound to, uh, to not work out. Yeah, especially in science, we are so much like it or working spaces like we have so many intense interactions within a group. I mean, okay, depends. Like right now in like Madden's Babu group, we are really working on the intersection of so many technologies and topics. And I love that. And kind of a, it's like very much appreciated if you, you know, consult with people which do like slightly different technique or have knowledge from other fields. And that really drives... Uh, new discoveries i would say yeah yeah so uh, you mentioned you know applying and being matched and finding the right match in martin lose's lab um what was the one thing that you know you drew you to to the team other than the science and the quality of the science yeah it was like quality of the science it was extremely important but like it was mostly also because they were doing pharmacology and at that time I already knew I really want to know like what's the mechanism how drug works. I like during my master time, I was looking really what are more the consequences of that mechanism. So mm -hmm. what were the side effects and so on? But in order to understand those, I believed you need to go a bit back and really understand the mechanism and mm -hmm go to very basic points and really going from, okay, we were describing maybe side effects, but no, I wanted to know what's happening on the scale of a receptor. Yeah. So that it, that was very important for me, but then also like really the nature of uh, 
how they do discovery. So like Club of Martin Moza, like uh, did a lot of microscopy because he probably very early on realized that people to believe they need to see things. So yeah. kind of a microscopy is very important to like show like certain processes and like he went on and developed many techniques which then facilitated that we saw receptors like interacting yeah. in the single molecule precision, for example, mm -hmm. or like measure the kinetics. So like really to understand certain mechanistical principles of the system. So I like that it's a kind of a pharmacology coupled to microscopy. Yeah, yeah I was, I think I, I really liked some, he has some really, really seminal key pieces key papers out there which are really amazing yeah and, uh, like and he he knows how to deliver them in a very you know effective understandable and very elegant way this is what i really learned from him you know he knows mm -hmm. what that k figure and what we need to communicate there mm -hmm. and uh, yeah that was i've never seen him give a talk um but i would love love the opportunity to to you know, have him potentially at one of our Dr. GBCR events to see 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 him in action. The yeah, live. he's very good at uh, delivering talks too. That's amazing. That's amazing. And how long were you were you in the lab? Uh, I was there almost five years. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, the group was before situated in Wordsburg. Yeah. They just uh, move or they moved, and like, I, then I joined. Mm -hmm. But then later on, Martin Lozet went to found another institute in uh, near Munich. It's more yeah. like biotech company, Easter mm -hmm. Bioscience. So I was kind of in a group during that transition. And it was very busy time for him, I think. Mm -hmm. He was leading two institutes at some point, like Max Zerbrück Center for Molecular Medicine, but also Berlin Institute of Health. Um, so... He was not a lot of around, but when he was, it was very efficient. So like even having, you know, meetings on the go or like even having like, I started to appreciate even having 15 minutes, like yeah. it was super efficient. I love it. I love it. And what made you, you know, continue in, in the lab? Well, how, 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 what was the transition? Actually, let me take a step back. How was the transition from Europe to the U.S.? Um, yeah, I totally didn't want to go to US. I never traveled in US, whereas I traveled all around Europe. I really like traveling. Mm -hmm. And then it was just because I really thought I need to like go to some like group which I really, really like, of which work I'm very impressed. Um, so like always when I would read uh, articles from Madans Babulap, it was wow, that's so nicely analyzed, thought, like visualized. Yeah. And like uh, from the point when I kind of now understood the system like a bit at the at the receptor level, I wanted to start to understand like a broader perspective. So kind of a go more going to the system pharmacology, system biology like uh, a field. And he's very good with those things. He also has a very good understanding of different topics. At the, he likes to say the different levels of complexity, yeah. you know, from the like single receptor to the like tissue perspectives, like like variations in the population. So it was really uh, the systems approach which they are taking on but uh, also like because he's a really nice person yes. and like the group is such an inclusive and nice place to do science so that uh, when i started to speak with him i i was not really happy i need to move to us <laughs> um, but i thought it's worth so yeah, he's wonderful. I've I've met him and he's been multiple times invited to the podcast and he kept saying, yes, yes, yes. I just don't have the time now. Yeah. <laughs> and now that I'm looking at the calendar, I think it's uh, in the, for the past year, we've been corresponding and saying, yes, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. But I think this is a good opportunity <laughs> for me. I to can, be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can you can say, actually, it was really fun or I hope at least. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then hopefully get him on. 
Um, what is your favorite GPCR? We talked a little bit about it before we hit record, but I'm curious to hear. Yeah, like in reality, I like all, or I'm really impressed by the kind of a multimodality of like what they all can do. But it would be on song to say anything else than fertility hormone receptor here because I just spent, you know, four years with it during my PhD. Yeah. And I really love the whole class of uh, class B of GPCRs because uh, they are so relevant for disease, like those receptors yeah. which are binding hormones and they're yeah. regulating many physiological processes. Yeah. Um, and um, like what I really like also about the GPCR, which I studied it, or like the class B GPCR is that they have a like interaction partner ramp. So uh, that there is not only the receptor, but another partner, which is uh, modulating uh, specificity, selectivity mm -hmm. of the many processes. And like now over the years, especially last 10 years, I believe were very, uh, uh, very good for RAMP research. Many groups like describe new roles, roles in the diseases. There are more and more tools to study it. And uh, uh, yeah, that I really liked. But uh, parotid hormone uh, receptor per se also has many roles, also has two ligands and regulates from calcium homeostasis, bone metabolism. It has a role in certain disease. So it's also superstar per se yeah yeah i think it's hypoparathyroidism which is all it's always a mouthful and osteoporosis i think for pthr1 yes and there are also some diseases jansen chondroplasia or Eichen syndrome when you have constitutive uh, uh, form of the receptor and they mm -hmm. still don't have like drugs uh, yeah. but yeah also porosis is kind of a they try to treat it with uh, teriparatite and aboloparatite those are analogs of mm -hmm. the shorter okay. version of the hormone of the yeah. peptide yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah there are some diseases like which still need uh, therapeutic intervention so we would need uh, some drugs there too so yeah. it's nice to hear like i was really happy that uh, you commented like about the insights from the conference which you attended yeah uh, yeah. that there are also new potential like uh, molecules being developed yeah yeah I, and for, for for the for the listeners um we're recording this end of february we typ i typically don't like to say when we're recording these things because it takes a while for the episodes to come out but the second gpcr targeted drug discovery summit in boston just ended and it was this gpcr fest if they wanted to rename the conference, they could call it GPCR Fest because it was a collection of a hundred people. With it was a nice balance between academic scientists and also companies, and um, a couple of companies that were there. And yes, there was some one company working on PTHR one, and they were showing that they have a great agonist, uh, small molecule agonist, which is I think a differentiator when you look at pep peptide versus small molecule from from a you know therapeutic standpoint in the sense that I, I guess the the one of the issues and you'll correct me because you're the you're the expert with the peptide is that the half-life is really short and I think it's an injection as well so uh, having a small molecule you could have a a syrup or a tablet or you know something easier to um to administer to patients and they can manage their own medication instead of having to go to to a doctor yeah like right now like those drugs are kind of a uh, okay effective but uh, they have uh, as all peptides bad pharmacokinetic properties so yeah. like instability like uh, permeability so like you mentioned also like half lifetime is like too short so patients need to administer the drug once every day subcutaneously with a kind of a you know small injection pen mm -hmm. so yeah it's not really the best uh, way to live with and this compliance of the patients like so i studied pharmacy we spoke a lot about it's it's really important that you like deliver the drug in a form which is okay 
to get it because if patient needs to like really take the injection every day, that's not good for his uh, quality of life. Yeah, no, for sure. It takes me back to one of the episodes we recorded with with Scott Struthers from Acrinetics. And what really caught my my attention is that they were so they're focusing on on small molecules. And um, there was one particular program they had that was directed towards um, the, the patients were children. And so they made a, a, a not a tablet, obviously, kind of a syrup type of formula. And they tested different flavors and found the one that covers up the small molecule bitter taste so that it's easier. And they had that in mind, which I think was really phenomenal to think about the patient and, you know. Not only the fact that it would help them, but also how and the level of discomfort that goes with that medication. And it's cool, like uh, how really they are another magicians, like oh, in pharma industry, which are working on those different ways of delivery. Because, like for a drug, what's really important to be effective is that you have a good concentration of it, or like high concentration of it, where it needs to work. So there is a whole science, like uh, pharmaceutical technology, like how you deliver the drug to certain compartments and uh, or it has like prolonged uh, acting times. Yeah. So it's not a, only about the pharmacodynamics, like which we are usually studying in terms of preclinical studies in the lab. Yeah. There is a whole word about pharmacokinetic, which also needs to be tackled and engineered in order that drug is uh, really yeah. successful then. Yeah, there was a lot of talk uh, at this meeting around the ADMI properties of, mm -hmm. of the drugs, and it's short for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Um which for yeah. when the first when when I heard it the first time, I was like, what is this acronym again? Uh, but it is important. All of these properties and qualities for a drug are important. It might do the right thing at a receptor level in the hex cell, but beyond that, there's so many boxes to check yes. when it comes to pharmacokinetics. This. Yes, <laughs> in short. <laughs> Amazing. And and what are you working on right now? So you mentioned PTHR1 and you worked on, on the receptor and during your PhD, what are you working on, if you're allowed to say? Or at least give us a highlight. Um, yeah, so like um, Madam has mostly computational lab, mm -hmm. but uh, he moved uh, recently from Cambridge to St. Jude. And then the idea was also to expand his experimental group. So I'm part of the experimental group mm -hmm. where we are building different screens. So they were like some studies from the pads where like they already did the screens but now we really want to have like in-house like uh, high throughput uh, screens where we can explore like the questions which we get from our data driven hypothesis uh, and I'm still working on GPCRs like um, building uh, a screen which will hopefully try to understand uh, like allosteric properties or like bias properties of the drugs so it's a bit of a, a methodology development and uh, but i'm still like uh, in gpcr signaling gpcr activation as i was before yeah i am really just starting so nothing too much to say but i believe it will be very exciting when it comes uh, to first results and so on. That's great. And, you know, you mentioned that the lab is is focused for so far has been mainly computational. And I think, you know, it's 2023. And if you can, you really do want the marriage in your lab or in your team between the wet lab and the computational side, because we've gotten to a point where we can generate so much data from the lab that as a human brain, it's very difficult to appreciate the subtleties that this data might be able to tell you. So having the computational methods to complement and better understand what the data is telling you is really key. Yeah, yeah. 
I actually came initially because I wanted to learn computational methods to complement, mm -hmm. you know, my experimental results. And uh, right now I'm trying also, yeah, to work on both sides. Yeah. I'm mostly still on the wet lab side, but mm -hmm. I'm learning like uh, to analyze data in a, um, in like big data in a manner which is like more efficient, reproducible, mm -hmm. and also generate like experimental principles which will create, you know, it's more going towards like what prob probably industry does. To have really the pipeline about okay let's generate data let's analyze it yeah. so we can be efficient at all the stages that's amazing do you have any any specific focus for a specific gpcr or you're really looking perhaps at a family again if you're comfortable sharing yeah like we uh we are like right now still deciding on which like gpcrs we, we will work because like our focus is to understand so allosteric and like bias so it will be probably like uh, gpcrs which have already like appreciated yeah. role in like those two things yeah well i think and and you make a you know you make a great point where you're leading to a great point when you're saying that you know you, you really want to develop a system where you can very quickly uh, screen for compounds and then have the computational aspect of it also set up so that very quickly you can go through the data and then make decisions based on what the data tells you. But at the same yes. time, in order to set this up, you need a GPCR or a family of GPCRs that is very well characterized, that you know what's going on, you know you have tool compounds, you have tools to develop the process and then, and only then you can go back and work on the funkier GPCRs uh, like orphans, for example. Yeah, exactly. Like we need like tools and like uh, better methods, but like it's really nice that the field is uh, progressing in that manner very much in the last years. We got so many new biosensors like uh, new technologies like we get more and more yeah tool ligands we get always better fluorophores better fluorescent proteins yeah um so the field is really advancing and that also like drives the like or accelerates how quickly we can like test some hypothesis no i think i think it's it's absolutely true which takes me to my next question that i ask from from everyone and the answer has been 100% yes so far but I'm, if you don't mind i'm going to ask you to elaborate a little bit about so yes why yes as do you think gpcrs are, are still good drug targets okay so yeah like statistics like speaking for itself yeah. i actually went and looked up because like i i read it was slightly more about 100 in some report like 134 gpcrs are drug targets and the number of the drugs is like way way higher mm -hmm. so and there are still many of the like uh, drugs in the clinical trials and there are like many opportunities so there yeah. Yeah. these like mentioned a bit orphan receptors we really need to identify their role like in our body yeah um in order to target them, but there are like certain like things as alpha fold, which already help by also understanding the orphan receptors better, mm -hmm. because before it was more just about the sequence alignment, yeah. like to understand to which like uh, groups they are like near, but now also alpha folds like helps to understand a bit of the structure. So, that is very helpful. And then like bias and uh, allosteric. Like uh, I was always interested in the precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And then like in the beginning, more in the in the light of pharmacogenetics. But uh, uh, right now, I really believe that uh, functional selectivity and really having very specific drug targets or like... Uh, chemical matter that it can interfere with uh, or drug targets in a very specific way it's uh, the key for the like future like drug discovery so really identifying like where receptor is expressed how it signals and then like trying to target uh, those conformations which are like 
setting very specific response. Um, so confirmation, like people are speaking about the confirmational selection or confirmational selectivity. And I believe that the field really progressed in that way. So we do understand that certain receptors, for example, for a teeth hormone, like there was a very nice study from Jean-Pierre Villadarga, which showed that like the spe uh, spatial bias matters. So yeah. if per teeth hormone receptor is on the membrane or in endosomes, like signals towards different functional outcomes, one which is regulating phosphate uh, metastasis, another is regulating um, vitamin D synthesis. So if you have a drug which can target one of those compartments, you can regulate just one and avoid side effects. So yeah. this kind of understanding about bias, um, it's uh, really important or in allostery, um, kind of a, we know that binding site of like similar receptors is uh, uh, often conserved, but allosteric parts are not. So you can very specifically target like uh, allosteric compartments or like pockets or like what's also very modern or like cryptic pockets, which yes. might be there just in some like, uh, like just for a very short period of time during the receptor activation yeah. and are very specific to like uh, a receptor can be really one of the, yeah, this will be very, very interesting to observe in the future, how the field uh, goes on. Yeah, and and I, at the meeting I was at earlier this week, um, there was there were a lot of talks around allosteric modulators, but also around the fact, you know, so it's it's a tough, I think it they're difficult to find. They're not impossible. They're also you need to have a certain level of understanding of molecular pharmacology G to be able to characterize them properly and better understand what they do. But how cool is this? Once you figure out, okay, this little molecule or this, this compound, this chemical matter binds at this position of the receptor, and this is what it does on the orthosteric ligand. I think it's just... Uh, we're not, com I don't think we're completely there yet, but we're understanding more and more and having the um, the availability of more and more cryo-EM structures, the possibility of actually generating more structures and really sampling the conformational landscape is just phenomenal. Exactly, yeah. Like, uh, I was always very much impressed about those allosteric uh modulators not only those which like as a ligand but also those which are like inherited in like on in our system like ramps you know yeah. like uh chrysotonin like receptor together with ram one two or three like uh responds to different ligands has different functions so yeah. like and now by the ability of like cryam that we can get like bigger and bigger complexes we really understand those potential binding sites better. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more. I'm intrigued um, about RAMPs and PTH receptors or class B GPCRs. Um, so like uh, RAMPs or receptor activity modifying protein, they were like uh, described in uh, like late 90s. Um, I believe that uh, by luxus line like I yes. know that Fiona Marshall was part of the like initial yeah. study which was published in Nature. Yeah. Where Steve Ford were... was yeah. also on that, yeah. Exactly. So like uh, initially they uh, they didn't understand by certain receptor, like a stunning like receptor kind of in different cell lines responds yeah. uh, uh, to ligands uh, differently or has a different outcome and then they realized that there is another like partner which it needs to function properly. So if you have only calcitonin like receptor, you won't get a response. But when you have it together with RAM2 or uh, 1, 2 or 3, you will get it. And those accessory proteins then like around early 2000 started to be appreciated not only to interact with calcitonin like receptor, 
but also with other class B GPCRs. And uh, right now, like uh, 25 years after its discovery, they're appreciated to interact with like uh, almost all class B GPCRs, but also some like class A or class C GPCRs. Mm -hmm. There are different studies of different, like with different methodology. And sometimes we find out that in some system, they are interacting, sometimes not. So I really believe that uh, different cellular background plays uh, like extremely important role in like uh, uh, in activity of the complexes uh, with yeah. uh, ramps. Um, so I was working on protein hormone receptor interaction, like mostly with ramp two. There was described interaction with the from the early study from two thousand three with uh, of Patrick Sexton, where they were like observing that this comp uh, that the complex can translocate to the uh, membrane. So ramps are sometimes appreciated also as a molecular chaperones, mm -hmm. but there was no a lot of functional data what it could do, and. Uh, Martin Lose had a very good idea to look at it at the like receptor activation perspective. So, okay, if they're really forming the complex, there should be some interaction which would like allosterically like change or prime receptor activation process. And yeah. how to do that um, with like the some sensor which is like looking at the receptor conformation. And uh, so I took some old protein hormone sensor and uh, designed a better version of it. And also, uh, which had two fluorophores of so red sensors. And I was looking at the receptor activation um, together with RAMP. And then I was also measuring different uh, signaling outcomes, like in different functional assays. And what we could, uh, in the end, uh, Right on, it was that uh, it looks that uh, ramp makes uh, protein hormone receptor activation faster. So it kind of primes it, it puts it in a different conformation. And from that conformation, receptor can activate quicker. And it looks that this has uh, also like uh, impact on a different amount of beta arresting which is then binding because we observed like higher beta restin recruitment when uh, RAM was present. And interestingly, uh, also different groups uh, across the board like are observing differences in the uh, beta restin binding when like GPCRs are together with RAM. So there are some um, GPCRs which have like more, but also some which have less. There is a study from Graham Lads gastrointestinal peptide receptor, they also see like higher beta resting recruitment. Whereas for example, with glucagon receptor, they see smaller um, beta resting recruitment. So right now we know about RAMs that they are like modulating ligand binding, receptor activation, G protein coupling, beta resting recruitment, like internalization processes. So they do uh, they got like uh, more and more important role in receptor pharmacology over the years. I love it, and and there is there I I find them very interesting, and ramps kind of have an interesting, um, had an interesting effect on Kathleen Caron's um yes. career. And if you listen to to the podcast with her that came out yesterday, and so she she was a avoiding GPCRs until she ended up working on ramps and then ramps got her back into the GPCR world. What I, I'm, I'm really curious, do we know of diseases where we know that ramp plus GPCR is important? I'm thinking here, could if we know, would it make sense to target a ramp GPCR complex? Yes, and there is first ever anti-GPCR antibodies uh, is actually like against a complex of uh, calcitonin-like receptor together with RAMP1. And this is like a very good treatment for uh, migraines. You know, migraines, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So that's the most prominent example, but there are many more examples. So a group of Kathleen Caron, which was uh, also my examiner. So I know uh, 
her like she was like following my work and it's like such a nice uh, person but also great scientist she always had such a good examples how to like try to put that more into the physiological context because this is the context where she uh, came out so she has a study where she showed that uh, ram3 is uh, cardioprotective in sex dependent manner uh, then uh, there are like many studies which are showing also role in glaucoma uh, there is a study showing potential role in uh, um, in placenta together with parotid hormone and calcitonin receptor actually and that was like a point why we started to study that interaction because we knew there is some underlying functional relevance. So apparently, if you knock out uh, RAMP2, there is some uh, dysregulation of like calcium and parotid hormone expression in placenta. And, uh, and actually mice doesn't survive. So, um, and uh, that was also the point why it was so interesting for us. So kind of, a, it really shows that that interaction matters. But there are many more studies uh, which are showing that RAMs are important. There is also a very nice study from consortium of uh, French hospitals showing that uh, adrenomentulin receptor interaction drives uh, angiogenesis in cancer. So on very different levels, yeah. um, it seems to be important. Amazing. Thank you. That's that's a really amazing review of what <laughs> ramps in a pathophysiological setting. That's that's really, you know, I, you were talking, I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know any of this or most of this. I don't know. I'm going to have to go and, and read up about it a little bit because it's so interesting. And this is how it starts. We people clone proteins, GPCRs, ramps. We try we co-express them. We try and understand and then we really want to link them to a pathophysiological state um and then yeah, but know, here it was reverse <laughs> yeah exactly exactly which i think it doesn't matter as long as we figure out the connections uh long term and then that enables drug discovery i think it's uh the order doesn't matter at this point as long as we figure out what which way it goes um we haven't spoken a lot about um advice to junior scientists uh, who want to contribute to the field. You've traveled, you have a very interesting, you know, family background. You had your family uh, from a scientific perspective gave you this desire to be to be in science. Any advice for, science, for junior scientists who want to contribute to the field? So I, at this point, really need to, I would always say to the people, go out, speak with people, go to conferences. Uh, conferences are such a nice podium to like learn new things, yeah. like introduce collaborations. Like uh, it helped very much to like keep up with the like new sciences relevant to the field. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I really need to tell that like very big uh, role in my scientific upbringing in the last two three years had Ernest. So like in Europe we have those different consortium which are financed by European Union, mm -hmm. and one of them is Ernest. And especially when pandemics hit, Ernest was having online conference every half a year. year. So like I was watching those conferences and really learned a lot. They gave me opportunity to have a talk two times actually. And uh, I was also organizing one of them. Um, so it really helped to like see what are like, uh, who are the key people in the field? What are the key discoveries? Like it helped me to understand the field very much. And uh, as I said, yeah, like conferences or presentations, this is like the most efficient way how I can absorb the knowledge. Mm -hmm. I am very visual person. So mm -hmm. that was uh, that was very efficient way how I learned uh, and I met people. Um, there are also other organizations like that, for example, at here and RISE, which is focusing on you know, uh, adhesion receptors mm -hmm. and uh, there is a very nice uh, transatlantic symposium 
which is a kind of a beautiful way to connect people across the pond. And um, so for me, I think it's very important to have like those safe spaces for young scientists when they can like ask questions, learn something new. Ah, actually, there is a, like a training school of earners just like happening yes. for two weeks. And it's such a good place to really ask experts in certain technology of in, or in certain GPCR what's going on there, really. So um, yeah. I really yeah. do appreciate like those uh, uh, research networks. I think I think that's that's a great set of of examples of opportunities that bubbled up with with COVID, and I've attended a lot of these. I was at the Ernest conference I think twice, uh, transatlantic as well. Uh, I think they're coming back this year, um, and I think it's it's really important to be together. And I think Zoom. And and platforms let's say like Zoom really enabled to form these connections, and um, I think it's a great advice. In short, talk to people <laughs> because and you actually to, like, yours, yeah. yeah, yours like Doctor GPCR too. Like it's also everything. Like in the beginning, I was really hearing each podcast. It was such an insult, insightful way to learn, like or like start to be aware of what's coming out what's new in the field um and like then you added also the symposium and all the other thing all the ecosystem that's again a very nice example like how young people can can contribute and like be engaged yeah, and and say yes when I invite you to the Doctor GPCR podcast. And if you want to come, just shoot me an email. Um, and I'm 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 telling you this because you were you know you accepted right away, and I was very happy about it. But I've had multiple instances when I emailed either PhD student masters, actually, yeah, PhD students and postdoc who said, well, you know, I don't have twenty five years of experience in the field, and exactly. My, I was... my, my argument is it doesn't matter because you're an expert at your own project. You are going through an experience in your life and there are people who have not gotten to your level, which means they can learn from you. You know, um, all the advice you had, um, you, you've shown the breadth and depth of your scientific knowledge. And that is a lot of work and a lot of energy that you put into and I think that's important for the younger generation to understand that, yes, we've had high profile guests. That's how you get people to listen in. But this is not a platform that's exclusive to the high profile guests. It's exclusive to the GPCR community. You're working on GPCRs. You're welcome to come in and chat. So I'm putting it out there for those uh, listening to this to this podcast episode because I think it's important. And I think I love I collaborated with Ernest with the Transatlantic uh, Symposium team. Great, great, great initiatives. Yeah. Cool. All I was right. Also a bit yes, like uh, okay, surprised and okay, why are you inviting me? <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought okay, like it's. It should be that way, you know, like not yes. only like the people on the top, but uh, like it's important to hear yeah. many stories. And yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, the reason why they, there haven't been enough, in my opinion, enough stories like yours and guests who are PhD students or, or postdocs, not because we never made the invitations. It's because most of the time I have to make a case as to why you should come on the podcast due to the fact that we've had these headliners um, on the podcast. But this is how you learn. You you come and I cannot stress it enough. Everyone, if you're working on the GPC, on a GPCR, in the GPCR field, you can be working on beta restins. We like you just as much. Mm -hmm. Everyone is welcome on the podcast. And I think we've even um, on the website, on the podcast page, there is a link where you can apply all that means is that you just tell us that you're interested and we'll reach out to you. Which uh, everyone is welcome. The, the whole goal of the ecosystem is to bring us as a community closer together because that's how we grow. That's how we better understand the role of ramps 
in uh in physiology and that's how we better understand gpcrs and if we were to spend our time you know in our little corner working in the lab and we would never talk then we'd never form these relationships and by having these conversations it's how we take the field forward yeah all right last but not least top three aha moments that you had in your life as a scientist that shaped your trajectory Okay, yeah, that was a bit hard. I needed to think. But <laughs> uh, I have at least one which was, yeah, like right now when I think it, it kind of sounds a bit naive, but it was when I realized it, how biosensors work, like in detail, kind of a really those conformational biosensors uh, which I was using to send different conformations. Yeah. So, okay, we are expressing something in the cell and like we are adding the ligand and something moves and then we translate that to the receptor activation process, you know? I mean, now if you think in a way, you know, like we have two fluorophores, there is a thread which like between them because they are in the near vicinity. Yeah. And like during the receptor activation, like um, fluorophores move and that's kind of a, the, the change in the distance we can detect as a change in threat yeah. and it was wow okay biosensor in a living cell you know and we yeah. can translate that to measure some like valuable metrics as receptor activation kinetics dynamics i felt like really wow we can you know really learn a lot uh, from that uh, and still today i think it's very important to to like I always have a slide about that on my presentation you know mm -hmm. like I try to explain people how that like uh, threat sensor works because this was like really aha like when I got okay yeah this is how we get like information about receptor activation process and then I understood like the whole you know experimental setup and all the things which we can get from it way 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 better so I really think it's very important that uh, people represent like this kind of a method or technique which they use in a very good way because it helps you to communicate your research uh, better so i always have a slide or like a figure which represents kind of experimental design i like that you know and uh, i i think i have to say i agree with you when i think about something really cool. I mean, these biosensors are really awesome. And you think about a GPCR and you're like, oh, no, no, you don't want to add, I don't know, huge GFP to it because it's yeah. going to be, it's not going to work. And it turns out that it actually does work. The receptor doesn't really mind. And I'm, you know, referring to the receptor as its own person. I've always told people, I think every GPCR has, an, has a personality, and uh, you you have Good to get play. to know them and, and see if, you know, you're compatible or not, or you get to bend the GPCR to your will to get the experiments to work. Um, but I think, I think it's just phenomenal. I was, I was watching a talk yesterday and they were talking about this GPCR that binds a peptide and the original peptide is huge. And they were able to, um, you know, by doing mutagenesis to reduce the size of the peptide to a nine mer. And it still activated the receptor and like, what? And then, but then the question comes is why would mother nature make a long peptide? What don't we know yet? But still, I think that's this, this flexibility in the system, especially when you're looking at, uh, I'm thinking here about the uh, Jean-Pierre Villardarga's papers, the FRET papers where you have the sensors mm -hmm. within the same receptor and you're looking, I mean, come on, how cool is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this was really the, when Jean Pierre there, Jean Pierre was still like postdoc with Martin Loza. Yeah. And yeah, I use one of his old sensors, but kind of a, we have no new fluorophore, so I could update it a bit that yeah. it worked even better. But yeah. it was, uh, yeah, those are cool tools. Exactly. And now we went from, you know, from these big, bulky GFP type of proteins to very tiny, bright, less quenching um, yeah, yeah, mini floor yeah minimal perturbation technologies yeah really yeah. just single amino acid labeling yeah okay 
actually it's still like when you look how big is then the label it's still big like yeah it's not yeah. only you know this kind of a one we change only one uh, amino acid but it's like a huge advancement and there is like a very nice study com will come out probably in a few months um like which was yeah measuring conformational uh, conformation with such sensors Nice. Excited to see that. I love I love biosensors, although I have to say I am Brett biased and not Fret biased. Uh, <laughs> Just because I've I've done Brett and not Fret. Uh, but then again, I think biosensors are really so so such an amazing thing to great tools to work with and better understand our favorite GPCRs. Any other aha moments uh, that you'd uh, like to share? Uh, I think they're like kind of a man just when you're doing some experiments. Like I like to say that I saw so we're shooting in real time. Mm -hmm. And I really uh, appreciate a big portion of a creativity which you need, you know, to kind of uh, find a way that like experiments and finally works. Yeah. Um, and those are really those kind of uh, moments when it's, whoa, but I need to do it that way. And then yeah. those are kind of a, whoa, uh-huh. <laughs> And I finally I cracked you cracked the GPCR or <laughs> the GPCR just decided to be friendly to you <laughs> that when that exactly system. yeah and it really like uh, helps to keep to be alive a bit you know it's like this kind of a excitement yeah. moment yeah. yeah so and yeah they're like happening like often when you just do this kind of experimental design but also sometimes when you analyze the data and you see something unexpected and then you're like, oh, whoa. And you kind of a uh, wheels in your mind are spinning. Yeah. And then, oh, whoa, whoa, is that? And you assign a new hypothesis to your experiment. Yeah. So those are nice moments. I love it. I love it. Katarina, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, it. Many, many thanks for your time. Like it was uh, an honor to be here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I hope we get to uh, we get to appreciate your work that you're doing very soon uh, in Madan Bubu's lab. I know that you just started, but I can't wait to see what comes out. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our guest, our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila, Ines, Monse, Ivana, Andrina, Balint, and, Jul and Julia. A huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support. Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with us and with our partners directly in the ecosystem. So make sure that you join us today. Also, please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube. And if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial on our website. Another way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. You can always email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.